Back in 2013, the Xbox One was released as a successor to the Xbox 360 and a competitor to the also newly released PlayStation 4. It featured a new design, much more powerful hardware, plenty of new features and more. It was a pretty good successor to the 360, and it's continued to improve with updates and new models as time went on. The Xbox One, even the original model, is still a popular console for gaming today. But now, it's been over 10 years since its initial launch, so how does it hold up all these years later? How does it hold up? Well, it is three different models, or five if you count the Xbox One S All Digital Edition and Xbox One Elite as their own thing, but I'll group them in with their respective counterparts for a majority of this video. For the main three, there was the original Xbox One released in late 2013, which is what I have here, the Xbox One S, released in mid-2016, and the Xbox One X, released in late 2017. The Xbox One Elite was a special version of the original, sold from late 2015 to mid-2016, exclusively in GameStop and the Microsoft Store, from what I can find. It came with an Elite controller and a solid-state hybrid drive rather than a regular hard drive, being the only Xbox One model to do so, even the Xbox One X came with a hard drive. The old digital edition was a revision of the One S without a disk drive, which was sold from mid-2019 to mid-2020 for slightly less than its disk drive counterpart. The experience between the models is pretty similar, but especially the original and the S. The original sports two 1.75GHz quad-core APU modules for a total of 8 cores, combined with 8GB of RAM, but reserving 3GB of that for the operating use system and utility software. It originally came with a 500GB hard drive, but a 1TB option came later, in 2015. The Xbox One S shares all of this, but comes with increased resolution capabilities, moving from a maximum of 1080p to 4K, but with video playback and upscaling, not natively. Alongside this, there was also a slight improvement to the graphics hardware, and Ultra HD Blu-ray support was added. It was pretty impressive, considering all of this hardware was fit into a design 40% smaller, and included an internal power supply, rather than the external one the original had. This new design served as a way to modernise the Xbox One's look, and tell it apart from the previous model, and in my opinion it works great. This design is similar to the designs of Series X and S now, and feels miles newer compared to the design of the original, even though on paper their performance is similar. The Xbox One X is really where the performance is shaken up. It has two 2.3GHz quad-core modules with 12GB of RAM, but again 3 reserved for the menu, and a big graphics jump leading to an apparent 31% increase in performance over the original Xbox One, with support for 120Hz on compatible displays. At its release, it took the crown for the world's most powerful console, beating out the PS4 Pro in terms of raw hardware performance. The One S All Digital Edition is the same as the regular Xbox One S as far as I can tell, with the exception of the disk drive, meaning you must own the game digitally if you want to play it, as there's no way for it to read discs. The benefit was that it came cheaper, but personally I would prefer to keep a disk drive as I like having a physical copy of games, but that might just be me. I know some people don't really mind, so it made sense to have that cheaper option there. The Xbox One Elite was very similar to the Xbox One, the difference being here the Elite controller inclusion and a solid state hybrid drive over a regular hard drive used by the rest of the lineup. The way this worked is that apps and games used frequently were stored on the SSD, allowing for a smoother experience and faster load times compared to a standalone hard drive, like the Fusion Drive my iMac has. It came with 1TB of storage too, which is pretty good and double the base on the original Xbox One, although that had been upgraded to start at 1TB by the time the Elite came out. The Elite seems like a pretty good deal, but is beaten out by the One S and One X now, even if they don't have SSDs. But it's fairly easy to install one, so it loses that advantage anyway, meaning its Elite controller is the main benefit, but those can be bought separately. Although the Series 2 Elite controller appears to have reliability issues, so perhaps maybe not. Either way, it'll usually be better to look past it in favour of something newer, much newer, unless there's a very good deal. I'll go into more detail on that later. For now, let's turn our attention to what all this hardware runs. The Xbox One system software is said to run a modified hypervisor's host OS with two partitions for different tasks. Games run within one OS and apps within another. The shared partition is the custom virtual machine for certain apps on the home screen, and the exclusive partition another custom virtual machine. 
this time designed to run games. The Xbox One runs a stripped down version of Windows, originally mimicking the look of Windows 8, before being updated to match with Windows 10 after its release, and then being built upon throughout the years and adjusted for the next gen consoles which run the same OS with a couple extra features. As it is now, the Xbox One and its software are fairly well liked, but this wasn't always the case. The software seen now is the result of many tweaks and changes to the original vision for the Xbox One, which at launch was seen as a controversial vision. Back in the year of release, in the ancient past of 2013, Microsoft's idea for the Xbox One was not just to be a game console, but an all-in-one entertainment system, being presented as such in a press conference in May. Although this itself became controversial, it's not where the first issue with the console lay. You see, it had been rumoured for a while that the Xbox One was to be an always-on console, requiring a constant internet connection to function, which Microsoft hadn't confirmed. Despite this, it was still caused concern among consumers, especially after a tweet from a Microsoft employee Adam Orth, where he stated, Sorry, I don't get the drama around having an always-on console. Every device now is always on. That's the world we live in. Hashtag deal with it. Which brought more heat down on Microsoft, and despite them actively denying the always on rumours, the negative mood lingered for months. After the May press conference that presented the Xbox as an all in one entertainment system, many employees complained that the presentation took away from the good work being done, that that wasn't the soul of what the Xbox was, and that this approach confused customers and employees about the intention especially since the first 30 minutes was spent demonstrating the integration with TV. As a result, during E3 the games aspect of the console was the main focus, and things appeared to be heading in the right direction, or well, they were until Microsoft announced their idea for a different games licensing scheme. To sum up, the idea was that any game purchased was linked to the Xbox Live account of that person, and could be accessed from any console, could be played without disc after installation, could be shared to designated family members and, if a game was allowed to be resold, it could be at participating retailers. If someone wished, they could directly transfer a game to someone on their friends list, but only once per game. To synchronise licences, the console had to be connected to the internet once every 24 hours, and if a console couldn't connect, all the games would be disabled until an internet connection was established. Needless to say, this didn't sit well with many consumers, especially after the previous issues already raised about the always on feature. Concerns were raised about the digital rights management and felt that this infringed on customers' first sale rights for physically purchased games. As with this management, games would only be licensed to a user and never sold. Even owning a disc was just the way to install the game and not a means of ownership. It did mean that you could play the game without the disc once installed, but that you didn't actually own the game. Harsh critics said that Microsoft was becoming anti-consumerist and punishing their loyal customers, and that by simply not including these always online features, Sony had made their PlayStation 4 the console to get for the upcoming holiday season. After all this backlash and some back and forth, Microsoft agreed to change their policies, making it so that after a mandatory software update after the initial setup, the console wouldn't have to be always online. The family sharing feature and ability to play games without their discs after installation had to be sacrificed, but this was seen as an acceptable loss if it meant having ownership of one's purchased games. This change of policy may have saved the Xbox. Its initial reputation had been hurt, but the issues surrounding it for the most part had been solved. Without these changes, I struggle to see the Xbox selling like it did. The PlayStation 4 still did beat it out, having roughly double the sales, but the Xbox One by the end of its production had been estimated to sold about 58 million units, and I can't see this number being reached if Microsoft held firm about their game management policies. As time progressed, Microsoft recovered the Xbox's reputation, rolling out software updates which moved away from the all-in-one design to a more game-centric design. They realised what the console was seen as and what it was meant to be, a console. This led to the Xbox One S, the 2016 refresh of the console feeling a lot more of what the Xbox was meant to be. It was slimmer, sleeker, better, and its introduction video focuses on gaming. Some say this is what the original should have been, and I somewhat agree. But I don't know all the behind the scenes and how plausible the 40% smaller design would have been three years earlier. So I'm just happy they set the Xbox on the right course and followed through, even sacrificing the Kinect sensor board. This move continued with the Xbox One X debut the following year, claiming to be the result of all consumers' feedback and the world's most powerful console. It definitely felt it. 
all the changes felt gaming focused, the new capabilities, the design, the introduction, Microsoft had proved they'd listened, and that this console was what people wanted. The Xbox One X was sold alongside the S and One S All Digital up until the new Series X and S announcement in 2020, after which the X and All Digital stopped production, quickly followed by the S in the, at the end of the year, leaving the Xbox One with a respectable 7 years as Microsoft's main console. It hasn't been sold brand new since the end of 2020, almost 4 years ago, but that doesn't mean it's obsolete. Many people still use it, myself included. So let's look at the Xbox One in the present day. Currently, the Xbox One, even the original, is a solid machine for gaming. I still use mine and it doesn't feel its age, even handling Red Dead Redemption 2 like a champ. While the original's design and resolution may be considered outdated, it certainly doesn't feel that way to me. 1080p is perfectly fine for most things, and I'm still impressed by its capabilities. The One S is in a similar boat, but it can handle better graphics and its design doesn't feel out of place today. It can do HDR gaming and 4K upscaling, while not impressive as native 4K, it certainly won't look bad. Now, the Xbox One X. It's certainly capable today. If the others are fine, this certainly is too. It is capable of native 4K and is powerful enough for about anything the newer consoles can handle. The biggest bottleneck for every Xbox One is its hard drive, minus the Elite to a certain degree thanks to the hybrid drive. The hard drive included in every Xbox One works well enough, but is the reason for much slower loading times compared to the next gen consoles, which comes with SSDs as standard. It certainly doesn't make it unusable or even bad, and most people won't mind, but it is the main thing holding the Xbox One back. Fortunately, replacing the hard drive in your Xbox One with an SSD isn't too hard, and there's plenty of tutorials. The main benefits of running an SSD will be faster boot up times, faster loading times, a smoother experience, and supposedly some games will run faster overall. So if you're using an Xbox One, it's worth looking into. But if you're not too fast or don't want to go to the trouble, just plugging an external SSD and running games off it will provide similar benefits to games installed on it. Some say an SSD can bring an Xbox One X close to the level of a Series S. I can't know for sure, but I can see it being true. Plus, the Xbox One X has a disk drive and native 4K, while the Series S only has upscaling to 4K and no disk drive. So, this upgrade could, to some people, make the Xbox One X seem preferable to the Series S, if you prefer physical copies of games. Keep in mind, the Series X includes both a disk drive and native 4K, so it's just the Series S the Xbox One X can seemingly compete with. It seems the Xbox One is still for sure a strong gaming machine, especially with an SSD upgrade. But is it worth buying one? It's a little tricky to make a judgement, but overall you have to consider the original console is approaching 11 years old, the One S is approaching 8, there may be an argument for the One X, but it can really depend. Firstly, the prices of a brand new Series X or S is $799 and $499 Australian, and $499 and $299 US respectively. On the used market, they seem to hover about 50 to 100 less than their brand new price, whereas an original Xbox One hovers at about 100 Australian, the One S about 150 to 200, and the One S seemingly 250 Australian dollars. Whereas in the US, the original is upwards of $50, the One S is about $100, and the One X about $200 US. It's a bit of a tricky market, but a One X in good condition towards the low end of their price point may be a contender, more so in Australia than the States. On the other hand, if your original Xbox One or One S has died, but your controllers, cables, accessories and all that still work, it may be worth finding a replacement one rather than a new one outright. There are listings selling just the console with no accessories, games or cables for a bit less than the competing prices, so picking up a replacement for 50 to 100 bucks, depending on your model and region, may be worthy consideration for some, but a brand new Series S for 250 in the US is quite a price, and when the One X hovers at about 200 for a used unit, the Series S is the obvious choice for most. Although it's worth considering the disk drive and base storage of 1TB on the X compared to 500GB on the Series S, the Series S supports next gen games whereas the Xbox One X seemingly won't. It can be a tough call, especially with sales here and there for the Series X that I've heard about, which wins out over both. 
the right pick will depend from person to person. Right now, for me, the original Xbox One still serves its purpose just fine, and I don't feel the need for a new console just yet. But I know that many may be wanting to move to the next gen, especially if GTA 6 will be a next gen exclusive like it's looking to almost definitely be. I would hope the Xbox One X remains compatible, but it doesn't seem likely, and the GTA factor will be the final decision for many looking at consoles, I'm sure. At the end of the day, the Xbox One has been, and still is, a great console, serving myself and others for years, and likely continuing to do so for many more to come. It had a rocky start, but has redeemed itself over time, and while buying one now may be out of the question for some, many still enjoying one will continue to do so for many years to come. Thanks for watching this video, it's a bit of a longer one, but I guess I had a lot to say about the Xbox One. But anyways, see you again soon, and I'll try to get another video out sooner than 5 weeks, but no promises. See ya!